The Galapagos tortoise is the oldest living tortoise species in the world. They can weigh up to 415 kilograms, live for up to 120 years, and they are incredibly delicious. So delicious, in fact, it took them over 300 years just to get a scientific name. No live specimen ever made it back to Europe without being eaten on the voyage. In 1850, U.S. Navy Captain David Porter once declared, after tasting the Galapagos tortoises, all other animal meats fell off greatly in our estimation. So if it's so good, why is it not on the menu today? Well, dipping into existing populations would completely decimate the numbers, so it'd be a pretty limited time offer. So today, I'm proposing the creation of industrial Galapagos tortoise farms around a number of sites in Australia. <laughs> That's a joke, but we'll come back to that one later. <laughs> now, hopefully by now it's raising another question in your mind. Why is it that almost every mouthful of meat that we eat comes from just five different animals? To answer this question, let's go back in time a little bit. 10,000 years. We've just started to see the domestication of plants and animals. And for perspective, the global population is between 5 and 10 million people. So take the population of New York today and pff, send it out across the whole globe. At this time, there's some theories that we domesticated certain animals for spiritual worship. And only when we got too efficient at breeding them do we turn the surplus into a steady supply of dinner ingredients. Others talk about a criteria for domestication that made it possible to domesticate some animals, but, well, frankly, impossible to domesticate others. But even beyond this criteria, over time, there's a certain group of animals that expressed characteristics and traits that simply made them easier to farm and therefore cheaper to produce and more widely available, and that ultimately makes for better eating material. In fact, it was our ability to scale our production for certain animals that allowed us to meet the growing demand for meat and also ensure that those animals reigned supreme on our menus for a century to come. In fact, our ability to scale industrial animal agriculture and the efficiencies therein is simply breathtaking. We've harnessed these incredible breeding programs to perfectly craft creatures who are made for meat yield right down to a genetic level. We've harnessed breakthroughs in antibiotics so that we can take more animals and put them together and have them alive for longer periods of time. And our understanding of uh, essential nutrition and the role that it plays, the vitamins and the role they play with animals, means that we've now been able to take a lot of our farming and move it indoors, away from the heavy conditions of the outdoor world. Constant and enduring advances over the past century means that we can at any given point have 100 billion animals in our global food system. So if you take this and mix it in with a growing population, maybe 10 billion by 2050, what do you find is that we have more people with greater access to more protein than ever before. It's an incredible feat of human ingenuity. And it also poses one of the greatest existential crises we have ever faced as a human race. These breeding programs, perfectly optimizing animals, altering their genetics for more yield and meat, means that we have created for billions of animals lives that are not worth living from the very beginning, their legs breaking under their weight, pigs on top of each other, and cows very much the same. It's also leading to another kind of breeding program, one for antibiotic-resistant superbugs whose pandemic potential around the globe far outweighs that of COVID-19. And growing animals to make meat contributes more greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere than all transport methods combined. That's planes, trains, and cars. And clearing land to grow crops to feed animals is one of the leading causes of deforestation and biodiversity loss around the world. We are at the point already right now where 96% of all of the mammals on Earth, they're either humans or the animals that we grow to feed us. So let's take this and mix it with a growing population, maybe 10 billion people by 2050, and meat demand to, to double by that time. And what you find is the situation is, it's catastrophic. 
And the existential crisis for us, for all of us, is very, very real. Scientists have been warning us for some time about the relationship between our dinner plates and this climate countdown crisis that we're facing. Some studies say that as much as a 90% reduction in individual meat consumption is required just to stop things from getting worse. About three years ago, I went on to an exploration into my food choices and how I was impacting this climate crisis. I learned about some of these facts and these figures and about the state of the current food production systems. And one day I made a decision to adopt a plant-based diet, which as the name suggests means I stopped eating meat. For two years, I was strictly vegan. And then I wasn't. I started eating meat again. At first, it was just a one-off, you know, a sense of culinary pleasure and then this sincere pang of guilt. And then after that, it was only on rare occasions, just as sometimes food. I've been very good this year, so I can have that. And then slowly but surely, over time, it, it just became a normalized habit. And I'm quite embarrassed to get up in front of a room full of people here and admit that time and time again, I caved to temptation. And sometimes, even when I know all of the facts, my actions don't reflect the wider actions that I would like to see out there in the world. The sad reality of it is, I'm not alone. A record 72% of Americans said that global warming is of personal importance to them. In Australia, 79% of people say they're either fairly concerned or they're very concerned about climate change. And yet we're the two biggest meat eaters in the world. See, for most, there is this huge gap between the righteous choice and the more desirable one. It's an everyday challenge that for most of us, even the most conscious of consumers, it causes us to turn a blind eye and really not think about those everyday perils of our food choices. And in a world where we're constantly fighting off temptation, be it from advertising or social media or from social pressures around us, Sometimes it's just easier to eat the delicious thing. There's more information readily available today than there ever has been about the negative consequences of industrial animal agriculture and eating meat. But still, meat consumption globally, it is on the rise at a faster rate than ever before. Studies show that as people get wealthier, they just consume more meat. And with the huge emerging middle classes in places like Africa and China and other countries around the world, what we're seeing is an explosion in per-person meat consumption. And that's even more terrifying when you realize that there's over a billion vegetarians in the world, and the vast majority of them are not that way by choice, they're that way by circumstance. They're ready and they're willing to eat more meat as soon as it's more affordable for them to do so. And it makes sense. Meat is a phenomenal product. It is very very good, and this notion of consuming meat being a pleasurable act is something that is so deeply ingrained in the cultural fabric of societies and the eating habits of billions of people. So what if I told you that we could have our meat and eat it too? What if I told you that we could feed billions of new and existing meat eaters real delicious meat products, but in a way that's completely sustainable? What if I told you that right now, we are on the brink of the most important disruption in food and agriculture, literally since we first domesticated animals and plants 10,000 years ago? What I'm talking about is the next great domestication, the domestication of the cell. Right now, around the world, a number of companies are producing real animal meat products directly from the cells of animals instead of the animals themselves. It's called cultured meat, and it might just be the solution to our industrial animal agriculture problems. Okay, so how does this work? You can take a small sample of cells from an animal. It's a harmless biopsy, it's about the size of an almond. And from that, what you can do is isolate the stem cells that are responsible for building fat, muscle, and connective tissue, which really are just the building blocks of all of the meat that we eat today. What you can take is seed those building blocks into a cultivator, which essentially is a, it's a fancy beer brewery. It's a big tank. In there, they're fed with salts and sugars and amino acids, which is all of the essential nutrients that they need to grow. And they do. Trillions and trillions of cells divide and divide and divide, and then they come together to form complex structures. And then after four to six weeks, you get real 
delicious meat products like these that have been made with the cells of animals, but not the animals themselves. Okay, so there's at least a dozen scientists around the world right now who are rolling their eyes at how much I just simplified that. <laughs> In reality, it is a scientific and engineering challenge that demands and continues to demand some of the greatest minds in the world. But when you understand the payoff that is available here, it's so worth the challenge. An early study out of the University of Oxford suggested that by growing meat using the cells of animals instead of animals themselves, will result in a 98% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. It will re result in a 99% less land use and a 96% less water use. It also lowers the risk of any animal-born global pandemics. And by taking this production that's not impacted by climate or seasons or weather, suddenly production is available to countries that could never have it before. Not just those who have large swathes of arable land like we do. And from 250,000 euros for just one burger back in 2013, it's now being produced for less than $1,000 a kilo. And that still sounds like a lot, but it's projected to be less than any meat on our shelves in the next 10 years. And for the foodies in the audience, the connoisseurs, it doesn't stop there. See, by rethinking food from the ground or the cell up, we can reimagine not restricted by the criteria that we started with in the old systems. This might be new creations like beef that tastes like bacon. Or it might be that we get pork cells and lobster cells and we bring them together and we have a surf and turf burger. And truly, it's just as easy to grow the cells of a Galapagos tortoise as it is a cow. Or, what have we got together cells that were naturally rich in L-tryptophan? We brought them together to create this meat product that naturally elevates our mood. And then, after which, we drift off into this nice, rejuvenating rest. For everyone in the audience tonight, that would be a sleep steak. Okay, let's fast forward a little bit. Right? Thinking about a world where we're all eating cultured meat, what we found is that it's having incredibly positive impact on global hunger, on nutrition and general health for billions of people. It sounds like an absolute no-brainer, right? Well, sometimes the greatest of food staples don't come to market for the strangest of reasons. Let me give you an example. Put up your hand if you have had a food product with potato in it in the last week. That should be most of you statistically. Each of us eat, global, as global citizens, each of us eat 34 kilograms of potatoes a year, which if you think about 7 billion people, that's a lot of spuds. But it wasn't always quick to, this quick to catch on. In fact, in 1748, France outright banned the potato across the whole country. They thought that it looked like a small hand that had leprosy, and if you ate it, then you were at risk of contracting the same. They also believe that it would give you rampant sexual urges, but it's probably another TED talk. So look, to overcome the technical challenges that are associated with bringing culture meat to market, we're going to need some of the greatest minds, the greatest entrepreneurs, scientists, engineers, and policymakers to start working together. But to get over the trappings of the erotic potato leper myth, we need you guys to start talking about it. <laughs> My father's in the audience tonight. When I was a kid, my father told me that almost all problems could be solved by just simply having better communication. He'd say, start a conversation, let's just see what happens. So when I found out in 2017 that cultured meat was a thing and that I could have the meat and not feel that guilt and that also by being involved, I could potentially positively impact billions of lives, I got obsessed. I called everyone I could in the industry. And they told me, Tim, the verdict is very clear, we need more scientists. And if you don't have a PhD, well, you'd better have an MBA. And for a university dropout like me, that was a pretty bitter pill to swallow. So I did what I knew and had been taught, and I started a conversation. Just around the corner, actually, in Sydney, I started a panel discussion. The title, Why Should Australia Get Involved in Cultured Meat? I invited as many people as I could, was worried nothing would happen. And actually, over 200 people came that day. It was an incredible conversation. There were, the questions were intelligent. The energy in the room was vibrant. And out of that one conversation, that one day, that one event, I met my future business partner. I met the lawyer who would end up handling our patents. And I met the investor that was connected with the investor who actually ended up cutting our very first check. And if you cut to two years later, it's not just me. 
We're a team of 18 people and one of the fastest growing cultured meat companies in the world. And every single day, we have some of the smartest PhD scientists from around the world contributing to creating meat products directly from the cells of animals instead of the animals themselves. You see, the point I'm trying to illustrate here is never ever doubt the power of just one conversation. You never know where that's going to lead. So what I want you to do, not tonight, you've already had your dinner, but tomorrow when you're having dinner with someone else, I want you to start that conversation. I want you to ask them, all right, would you eat a burger that's made from the stem cells of a Galapagos tortoise? And when they look at you like you might have lost your mind, just politely explain to them that it might just save the planet. Thank you.